Some of you may have heard this paradoxical fact about medical tests. It's very commonly used to introduce the topic of Bayes rule in probability. The paradox is that you could take a test which is highly accurate in the sense that it gives correct results to a large majority of the people taking it. And yet, under the right circumstances, when assessing the probability that your particular test result is correct, you can still land on a very low number, arbitrarily low, in fact. In short, an accurate test is not necessarily a very predictive test. Now, when people think about math and formulas, they don't often think of it as a design process. I mean, maybe in the case of notation, it's easy to see that different choices are possible, but when it comes to the structure of the formulas themselves and how we use them, that's something that people typically view as fixed. In this video, you and I will dig into this paradox, but instead of using it to talk about the usual version of Bayes' rule, I'd like to motivate an alternate version, an alternate design choice. Now, what's up on the screen now is a little bit abstract, which makes it difficult to justify that there really is a substantive difference here, especially when I haven't explained either one yet. To see what I'm talking about, though, we should really start by spending some time a little more concretely and just laying out what exactly this paradox is. Picture a thousand women and suppose that 1% of them have breast cancer. And let's say they all undergo a certain breast cancer screening and that nine of those with cancer correctly get positive results and there's one false negative. And then suppose that among the remainder without cancer, 89 get false positives and 901 correctly get negative results. So if all you know about a woman is that she does the screening and she gets a positive result, you don't have information about symptoms or anything like that, you know that she's either one of these nine true positives or one of these 89 false positives. So the probability that she's in the cancer group, given the test result, is 9 divided by 9 plus 89, which is approximately 1 in 11. In medical parlance, you would call this the positive predictive value of the test, or PPV, the number of true positives divided by the total number of positive test results. You can see where the name comes from. To what extent does a positive test result actually predict that you have the disease? Now, hopefully, as I've presented it this way, where we're thinking concretely about a sample population, all of this makes perfect sense. But where it comes across as counterintuitive is if you just look at the accuracy of the test, present it to people as a statistic, and then ask them to make judgments about their test result. Test accuracy is not actually one number, but two. First, you ask, how often is the test correct on those with the disease? This is known as the test sensitivity, as in how sensitive is it to detecting the presence of the disease? In our example, test sensitivity is 9 in 10, or 90%. And another way to say the same fact would be to say the false negative rate is 10%. And then a separate, not necessarily related number is how often it's correct for those without the disease, which is known as the test specificity. As in, are positive results caused specifically by the disease, or are there confounding triggers giving false positives? In our example, the specificity is about 91%. Or, another way to say the same fact would be to say the false positive rate is 9%. So the paradox here is that, in one sense, the test is over 90% accurate. It gives correct results to over 90% of the patients who take it. And yet, if you learn that someone gets a positive result without any added information, there's actually only a 1 in 11 chance that that particular result is accurate. This is a bit of a problem, because of all of the places for math to be counterintuitive, medical tests are one area where it matters a lot. In 2006 and 2007, the psychologist Gerd Gigerenzer gave a series of statistics seminars to practicing gynecologists, and he opened with the following example. A 50-year-old woman, no symptoms, participates in a routine mammography screening. She tests positive, is alarmed, and wants to know from you whether she has breast cancer for certain or what her chances are. Apart from the screening result, you know nothing else about this woman. In that seminar, the doctors were then told that the prevalence of breast cancer for women of this age is about 1%, and then to suppose that the test sensitivity is 90% and that its specificity was 91%. You might notice these are exactly the same numbers from the example that you and I just looked at. This is where I got them. So, having already thought it through, you and I know the answer. It's about 1 in 11. However, the doctors in this session were not primed with the suggestion to picture a concrete sample of a thousand individuals, the way that you and I had. All they saw were these numbers. They were then asked, 
How many women who test positive actually have breast cancer? What is the best answer? And they were presented with these four choices. In one of the sessions, over half the doctors present said that the correct answer was 9 in 10, which is way off. Only a fifth of them gave the correct answer, which is worse than what it would have been if everybody had randomly guessed. It might seem a little extreme to be calling this a paradox. I mean, it's just a fact. It's not something intrinsically self-contradictory. But as these seminars with Gigerenzer show, people, including doctors, definitely find it counterintuitive that a test with high accuracy can give you such a low predictive value. We might call this a veridical paradox, which refers to facts that are provably true, but which nevertheless can feel false when phrased a certain way. It's sort of the softest form of a paradox, saying more about human psychology than about logic. The question is how we can combat this. Where we're going with this, by the way, is that I want you to be able to look at numbers like this and quickly estimate in your head that it means the predictive value of a positive test should be around 1 in 11. Or if I changed things and asked, what if it was 10% of the population who had breast cancer? You should be able to quickly turn around and say that the final answer would be a little over 50%. Or if I said, imagine a really low prevalence, something like 0.1% of patients having cancer, you should again quickly estimate that the predictive value of the test is around 1 in 100, that 1 in 100 of those with positive test results in that case would have cancer. Or let's say we go back to the 1% prevalence, but I make the test more accurate. I tell you to imagine the specificity is 99%. There, you should be able to relatively quickly estimate that the answer is a little less than 50%. And the hope is that you're doing all of this with minimal calculations in your head. Now the goals of quick calculations might feel very different from the goals of addressing whatever misconception underlies this paradox, but they actually go hand in hand. Let me show you what I mean. On the side of addressing misconceptions, what would you tell to the people in that seminar who answered 9 and 10? What fundamental misconception are they revealing? What I might tell them is that in much the same way that you shouldn't think of tests as telling you deterministically whether you have a disease, you shouldn't even think of them as telling you your chances of having a disease. Instead, the healthy view of what tests do is that they update your chances. In our example, before taking the test, a patient's chances of having cancer were 1 in 100. In Bayesian terms, we call this the prior probability. The effect of this test was to update that prior by almost an order of magnitude, up to around 1 in 11. The accuracy of a test is telling us about the strength of this updating. It's not telling us a final answer. What does this have to do with quick approximations? Well, a key number for those approximations is something called the Bayes factor. And the very act of defining this number serves to reinforce this central lesson about reframing what it is the tests do. You see, one of the things that makes test statistics so very confusing is that there are at least four numbers that you'll hear associated with them. For those with the disease, there's the sensitivity and the false negative rate. And then for those without, there's the specificity and the false positive rate. And none of these numbers actually tell you the thing you want to know. Luckily, if you want to interpret a positive test result, you can pull out just one number to focus on from all this. Take the sensitivity divided by the false positive rate. In other words, how much more likely are you to see the positive test result with cancer versus without? In our example, this number is 10. This is the Bayes factor, also sometimes called the likelihood ratio. A very handy rule of thumb is that to update a small prior, or at least to approximate the answer, you simply multiply it by the Bayes factor. So in our example, where the prior was 1 in 100, you would estimate that the final answer should be around 1 in 10, which is in fact slightly above the true correct answer. So based on this rule of thumb, if I asked you what would happen if the prior from our example was instead 1 in 1000, you could quickly estimate that the effect of the test should be to update those chances to around 1 in 100. And in fact, take a moment to check yourself by thinking through a sample population. In this case, you might picture 10,000 patients where only 10 of them really have cancer. And then based on that 90% sensitivity, we would expect 9 of those cancer cases to give true positives. 